My name is Tavia Danch, and I am the Community Outreach Manager here at Colorado State University Global Campus. I am pleased to welcome you to CSU Global's Career Success Webinar Series. We have a great program for you here today. I am excited to begin this afternoon's discussion. I want to introduce you to Sue Worden. She is the Career Navigation Services Specialist here at CSU Global. And Sue has more than 20 years of experience in career counseling and coaching. She has worked with thousands of people, including college students, executives, and transitioning military veterans to help them uncover, define, redefine, and move along in their career journey. Sue is a certified coach practitioner. She's a certified professional resume writer and qualified to administer and interpret a wide range of personality and career development tools. She will be discussing how organizations use applicant tracking systems to review resumes and tips on how to draft a resume that can make it past that initial first review. With that, I'll, time, I'll turn the time over to Sue. Thank you, Tavia, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Today, we're going to be talking about applicant tracking systems. Um, this is relevant to your resumes because when you submit an application um, for a, a job that you're applying for, chances are very good that you will be dealing with ATS. And ATS is short for Applicant Tracking Systems. Um, they are a software system that converts all of the resumes that are submitted into a consistent profile for each applicant. It filters um, resumes based on keywords, and these keywords are programmed into the system by the HR department or the recruiter based on the job description. And so um, th this is the way that they're able to find resumes that contain the keywords for the job. There are lots of different types of ATS programs and some, they've been around for a while, and some of them are more sophisticated than others. The newer ones are more sophisticated than the older ones. Um, next slide. So, um, as you probably imagined, uh, ATS is used by HR and recruiters to help streamline the candidate selection process. Um, it pre-screens these resumes before a person even sees them, and it pre-screens the resumes based on the um, keywords that are programmed into the selection process. Next slide. This is what um, a particular type of ATS can look like. Um, it, it, you'll see on the left-hand side the, the candidates' names, where they're coming from, when they submitted, and then the, the rating. And if you take a look at this, you'll see somebody has a four-star rating. That means that they have a percentage more of the keywords than the other people. If you look at, um, this is a scuba instructor position. And you'll see um, somebody down there at the very bottom is an anonymous candidate. And they are a net developer, and yet they got two stars um, for this scuba instructor position. And it's just based on the fact that they had certain keywords in there. What the, the problem with ATS is that it can screen out very, very qualified people if they don't have the right keywords in there or if it can't read the keywords. So the Andrew Candles there um, might be a really good candidate or he might not be just because he has the right keywords in there. And if you go down to Bob Fullerson, he only has two stars um, and maybe he's a great candidate but he just doesn't have the right keywords in there. So this is what some ATS will do is, is to rank the um, candidates. And of course, the recruiter and the HR people are going to look first at the ones who have a high rating. 
the ones that don't score anything, they're likely to not even take a look at them, even though they may be very good candidates. So that's why it's really important to understand that ATS is out there and how to deal with it. Next slide. Applicant tracking systems are really sensitive to formatting and special characters. The algorithms that are used are generally really basic. And so because they're so basic, it can garble um, what you have in there and it can merge information if it's set up, if it's formatted in a certain way. Um, and so an example here is how it's merged the word sales with resolved so that it it's, creates one word. That's not a word that was put into um, ATS as a keyword. And so it, it will mess it up. And if it messes it up too much, your resume is going to get rejected. So keep in mind, most ATS cannot read first paid head, headers, headers, excuse me. They, um, anything in a header cannot be read. So your name, your contact information um, won't be read by ATS if it is in a header. Um, it can, you, you can use a header on the second page, just not the first page. And if it can't read your name, um, it's likely to kick you out. So um, be very careful about using headers. It can't read logos or tables or text boxes. Pictures can throw it off so that it will reject your resume. Color and shading. A lot of people want their, their resume to look snazzy, and so they'll use color or, or shading for section headers. It can't read that. Um, most of, of the applicant tracking systems cannot read color, so if your name is in color, it won't read your name, and again, could kick you out. Any sort of fancy font styles or bullets. Bullets, you, you want to have them be solid round or solid squares. It can't read arrows, it can't read you know, the, some of these fancy uh, bullets that you see on, on uh, Word programs. So it's best to keep it simple. These types of things, especially text boxes and tables, logos, headers, will totally confuse the system and reject your resume. And if your resume is rejected, you're not going to get an interview. Next slide. So this is an example of what happens before and after ATS. You'll see on the left-hand side, Mark Singleton's resume, and it looks really nice. It's set up in columns, but if you look at the right-hand side, this is what happens to his resume after it goes through ATS. So um, you'll see CAD Red uh, is underneath his field service engineer position. That's not so bad, but look down below that. It has skills and abilities, CAD Red, Portland, Oregon. Okay, it's not pulling out the skills and abilities in the right place. Um, the bullets are, are thrown off. So this is just one example of what a parsed resume looks like after going through ATS. Next slide. And this breaks it down even more. Um, so it's just a visual for you to see what is happening with his resume. Um, next slide. So any of these, these types of formattings in resume templates um, will not get past ATS. And so resume templates are wonderful um, to use to save you time when creating your, your resume, but believe me, they are terribly problematic when you submit your resume to an online application. Um, nine times out of 10, the template will cause your resume to be rejected. And again, if it's rejected, you won't get an interview. So the formatting, most of the templates contain text boxes, 
and shading and color and um, some, uh, I even have like telephone icons, um, email icons on there. So we really do not recommend using templates that you find in Microsoft Office programs or on resume services that you'll, you'll find online. So the, the key is you, you want to keep your, your formatting simple. Um, if you do choose to use a resume template, you can use those to email people and to take to an interview if you want to present a, a nice looking resume. But it will not do you any favors in terms of getting you the interview. Next slide. So what I have here are a few um, examples of resume templates. They're very common. We see them all the time in um, our resume review process that we offer here at CSU Global. This is a very common one. Uh, the problem with this one is if you look at where the name goes, um, it's in a nice pretty blue box, but the type is white. And so the name, anything in there will not be read because it's not a black um, font type. This one also um, actually sets up your resume in, um, you know, so that it's not using white space well. Um, and so there's just a lot, of, a lot of issues with this one. We also, on this one, we don't recommend an objective statement. We recommend a professional profile. So if you come across this, you're tempted to use it, please don't. Next slide. Uh, this is a good one in that it has a lot of issues <laughs> with it because you've got a picture. And in the United States, we do not include pictures on resumes. Uh, pictures, that's where LinkedIn comes in. This is also set up in columns. So that parsed resume that you saw a few slides back where um, ATS took some things from the left-hand column and merged it with information from the right-hand column, that's very likely to happen. Um, next slide. And this is one that we see a lot also with the, the fancy little design up at the top. Name comes out in kind of that um, mustard colored yellow, um, an objective statement. And on all of these templates have you put your resume, your references on there. We don't recommend that. We recommend your references go on a separate document. So these are just three samples of many different resume template styles that you'll see out there. And we really encourage you not to use them. Next slide. So how do you get past ATS? You want to make sure that your resume, resume is well written um, and, and formatted in such a way that ATS will be able to read everything going left to right. Um, you want to make sure you save it in Word. Um, PDF is okay to also include. So if you come up um, to a, a job application and it asks for your resume and you can provide it in Word and PDF, that's okay. Use your very simply formatted um, Word document that you at attach in, in, and have saved in Word. Then you can also send in your templated resume if it's saved in PDF. And that, you'll be able to get around ATS doing that. So, but a lot of job applica applications do not allow PDFs. So you have to make sure that you have a resume that is in Microsoft Word with very simple formatting to um, use to apply for positions. Um, we see a lot of spelling errors that come through and ATS, if it is programmed to look at manage, and that's a key word, it will not recognize mange 
And not only will ATS kick you out for that, but it's also telling uh, the recruiter and the hiring manager that you are not attentive to detail in your resume. And um, you know, that's, that's gonna be a strike against you. You want to make sure that you tailor each resume for, uh, or for, you tailor your resume for each application by using the keywords from the job description that you're applying for. And one very easy way to do that um, is to print out the job application and just take a highlighter and highlight just the one words that pop out at you that are relevant to the position. So uh, something like team management or team building, um, uh, budget, those would be keywords that you wanna make sure that your resume contains to help you get past ATS. Um, if you have those, if you don't have them in your background, then don't include them. You want to try to include some soft skills and soft skills are things that you can't necessarily prove. How do you prove that you're well organized? Well, but if the job description, sorry, just a sec, ask for um, good organizational skills, you'll wanna make sure that you include that in your resume as well, because those could be keywords that are um, programmed into the ATS. You also, those functional skills such as project management, budgeting, strategic planning, um, procurement, um, sales, those are functional skills that are more than likely in the job description. Make sure that you have those in your resume as well. Okay, next slide. So that wraps it up for today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the wonderful insights, Sue. That was wonderful. I would now like to open the floor up for the question and answer portion of the webinar. As a reminder, to submit a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and type in the question. So now I will go ahead and start with the questions. So, so how closely should a resume optimize for an ATS, mere LinkedIn, or a hard copy of the resume? Can you say that again? Sure. How closely should a resume optimize for, um, for ATS, mirror the LinkedIn profile or a hard copy of that resume? I'm not quite sure I understand the hard copy part. Um, a resume is a resume, whether it's digital or um, printed out. So I don't know if we need clarification on that. Um, regarding LinkedIn, recruiters also use keywords on LinkedIn. Then when they're search, you know, sourcing candidates, a lot of people will just copy and paste their well-written um, resume into the career summary section of LinkedIn, and that's fine. That's okay to do that. Where you want to make sure that you um, optimize your LinkedIn, it, because you don't, you, you know, if you're not applying for a position, you can have as many keywords in there as possible. Okay, different than a resume. You can't overload your resume. You don't want to um, fill too much in there. And um, there, a few years ago, there was something that people caught on to, which was to stuff their resume with keywords um, in white font, a color, and so that visually you couldn't see the keywords, but it would then, you know, over, actually overload ATS. Well, recruiters and hiring managers have caught on to that, so do not do that. That will not speak well of you. So your resume, you wanna make sure it's customized to that position that you're applying for in that moment. LinkedIn can have as many keywords as you wanna have in there. And so that can be a specialty section under your profile can have a little specialties area with as many keywords 
of your functional areas as, as you want. And that will help recruiters find you. That's great information, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question, I am changing my career and my goal is to become a COO and eventually a CEO of a medical facility. Because this path is not universal, how can I optimize my resume for multiple positions that will lead to my employment goal? Okay, that's a really good question. I, I run into that a lot when I um, write executive resumes. And what you, number one, to just have a general resume is very, very difficult, especially when you can span different functional areas, such as operations and top level executive management. But a lot of those functional skills will relate to both. So if, if you want to be, if you're looking for a CEO position, say in a smaller company and a COO position in a larger company, a lot of those same keywords will fit um, in the same resume. So uh, p and if you've done p and as a COO and you want to do it as a CEO, you can keep that in there, okay? However, a job that you apply for, it may be calling it budget management and not p and So be very careful about that, but they match, okay? Um, so the, the good thing is a lot of things in operations, C-level operations, will fit with a COO position. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. Are there commonly used keywords for different sectors of employment? And what is the best way to determine what these words are? Different, okay, let's say that again. So first part of the question, are there commonly used keywords for different sectors of employment? Sectors of employment, I'm assuming that means functional areas of employment or perhaps industry? Yes, I would uh, assume so. Okay, so um, it just depends on the position. Um, I think technology, IT, is one where there are very common keywords in the IT industry, but if you're security and versus database management, those keywords are going to be different for you. So it, it, try not to think industry, try to think the job function, okay? Um, so when you're looking on Indeed or you're looking in, in, on LinkedIn for job positions, that's what you wanna key in on, is what you offer in those functional skills that are relevant to the job you're going for. That's great. And uh, the best way to determine these keywords, you've mentioned LinkedIn and Indeed. Are there any other sources that you can think of uh, that folks can determine what these actual words are? Um, I actually have a list of um, functional keywords that our resume reviewers are, are trained to look for. And they will, um, because we do offer resume reviews on, through Global Connect, as well as cover letter reviews. So just want to put a plug in for that. Um, so when you submit your resume for a review, the, the resume reviewers are trained to look for some of these. And if, if they're missing, um, and say you've, you've described something you do, but you don't have the right keyword in there, they will say, hey, you might want to add this keyword to your core competencies list because that will be a trigger for ATS. Um, so yeah, there there are. I mean, you know, so let's just say uh, IT cloud. If if you're um, you know familiar, if you're knowledgeable of cloud, that would be something. And, and your job that you want to do includes cloud. You want to make sure cloud is on your resume. Great. And are those lists available on Global Connect? No, they're not. They're just available through for our re resume reviewers at this point. Okay. Good to know. Uh, next question. Would it be recommended to include some personal traits that are listed on the description, such as dependable, attention to detail, etc.? 
You know, that's a really good question because it just depends. The word dependable, you're expected to be dependable if you're a professional at this point in your life. So that, that would be a word that, say, a very, very young person could put on their resume. But if you've been in, in professional environment for a while, that's just going to diminish you. So, um, you know, for, for positions that require a lot of attention to detail, um, such as accounting, let's just say, anything to do with money or organize, organizing, that can be um, important to put in there depending on your level, okay? So, you know, somebody who's been a, an accountant for a long time or their internal auditor for a long time, mm, probably not. You can put it in your cover letter because it's, if, if the job description is calling for that, yeah, it's okay to put it in there. But if, if you're at a certain level, there are other descriptors that are going to carry more weight for you, unless you're very young, okay? And then it's okay to put those in there. Great, and do you have any tips on how to incorporate those traits seamlessly into the resume without it looking like a, you know, shameless plug? <laughs> 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 well, first of all, you know, there is a certain amount of shameless plugging that you need to do in your resume. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, sometimes the easiest way to do that is to ask your colleagues, your coworkers, your friends to describe you and write it down. And then you'll want to turn that into incomplete sentences for your resume. You don't want these things to be in full sentences. It takes up too much space. This is something that people take six seconds to read. So you want it very easily and quickly read. Um, so, and, so that's one way to do it is find out how do people see you? Are you really organized? Okay. Yeah, if you are and other people see you that way, it's okay to say that because you're shamelessly plugging yourself. Um, but yes, the, generally speaking, the top portion of a resume, that's what people look at first. And so you want to have a really good, strong, uh, professional profile up there. Um, and that's where a lot of these softer skills can be added. Um, then the, the core competency section and what I'm talking about are the resume samples that we have on Global Connect based on each um, degree program and certification program. And you'll be able to see how these professional profiles are, are stated, you know, four, maybe five lines is all. And then the core competencies, those are the hard skills. Those are the things that you prove that you have in your background or in your knowledge base. So the soft skills are more in the paragraph. The, the hard skills are the bullets. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Next question. What is the difference between an objective statement and the uh, professional profile? Yes. Excellent question. An objective statement is generally what you want, what the candidate wants. And guess what? Employers don't care what you want. They care how you can meet their needs. So the professional profile or the professional summary is letting them know what you bring to the table that will help them, that will meet their needs. So that's why objective statements other than in accounting and some finance positions, objective statements should not be used. Um, but accounting and finance, a lot of the recruiters like to see objective statements that are stated you know, that you're seeking a position as a tax accountant, okay? Um, because then they know right away if you're going to fit with what they're looking for uh, versus, you know, a CPA, okay? So um, I, I hope I'm not confusing people with that. But that, again, is why the, the templates are not good to use 
because most of them have an objective statement where you say, I'm seeking a position where I can advance my skills and guess what? The employer doesn't give a hoot about that. They want to know what you're going to do for that. Great point. Okay, next question. Is there a standard way of approaching experience gaps on resumes due to having children, going back to school, and other life events? Standard way, no. Um, and it just depends, too, on how long of a gap that is. Um, if, if, it's, if you've taken years off to have children or to complete your degree, you can put a little you know, thing at the top saying, you know, uh, uh, took time to finish my degree, 2016 to 2019, up at the top. But you don't have to do that. I've seen some very well done that way. Um, generally, that's, you, you know, you'll address that in a cover letter um, that, you know, prior to completing my degree in 2019, I had X number of years as a programmer um, or a sales rep, something like that. Okay. Same goes for illness. Um, same goes for taking care of family members uh, when they've been ill. It, it, there are lots of people that have those kinds of gaps. And I know it can be really scary um, when you're looking for a job and, and and feeling like, oh my gosh, I've been out of this for X number of years. But employers understand that this happens. And so it's not as big a deal as you're probably making it yourself. So try to relax about that and, and uh, you know, deal with it in a cover letter. You, in a cover letter, if it's something personal, you don't want to say exactly what it was. You can just say took X number of years um, away from the job market. Okay, but if it was to raise children, it's, it is what it is. Great. So if I'm a current student, how can I get my resume reviewed at uh, Global Connect? On Global Connect, there is a section up at the top for submitting resume reviews, for review. Um, and it's a very easy process. Just make sure you're uploading a Word document, um, it, it becomes, uh, imp if, because of our system, we can't review things that are um, on a Google Sheet. Uh, we can, PDFs, we cannot provide comments on them, and so they will be returned to you and will be asked for a Word document that you upload. And how long, generally speaking, does that process take uh, to receive comments? Uh, we allow up to three business days for those review reviews to get back to the student. Generally, it's shorter than that. Great. Wonderful. So if we are in an extremely active search mode, should we alter the resume based on the keywords for each job description we apply for? Yes, absolutely. What I recommend in that case is... Um, in a job search, you're go I recommend having a variety of different resumes, okay? You're going to have your general, well-constructed resume. And then each time you, you have a, a job that you're going to be applying for, pull that up, make the changes based on keywords, then resave that with the company name in the job, in the, in the save title. So it would be... Sue.Worden or Sue underscore Worden CSU Global Resume. Okay, and so you can always go back to your general resume, but then each time you adjust it, resave it with the company name. And so you'll always be able to go back to it that way. You'll always have your general resume. And sometimes you'll come across job descriptions that are identical, just different companies. And so if you realize that, okay, I use this resume for ABC company, and it's the same words um, for XYZ company, use that resume, just rename it XYZ company. That's a great tip, Sue. 
Uh, next question, what is the recommended length of a resume? Again, that depends. If you're new in, in the job market, you don't want it any more than one page. Um, what recruiters and hiring managers do not want to see is page after page after page of, you know, bullet, 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 and it's one item in each bullet. Um, and generally, when you're first starting out, you may not have much job experience. Again, in our sample resumes, there are samples for inexperienced people as well as experienced people. After you've been in the job market for a few years, unless you've stayed with the same company for a long time, you probably are going to need to go to two pages. And, um, and that's okay. What we don't want to see are five-page resumes unless they are CVs, curriculum vitae's. Um, and those are generally for people in academia. And those are okay because they want to see everything you've done. Um, but even executives with 30 years of experience, you should be able to get everything on the two pages because in your career summary, you really only need to go back 15 years. And so after, you know, the underneath the, the one where you've gone 15 years, you just need a little thing at the bottom saying earlier, you know, sales rep at ABC company, bank teller at XYZ bank, okay? So there's a way to keep it to two pages, and, and believe me, recruiters really appreciate that, unless they ask for a, a full account of every job you've had. Great, and just to add to that, uh, what is the recommended length of a cover letter? Generally one page. Um, the only time where it would go beyond one page is if you have extensive experience that is relevant to the job you're applying for. It can run onto two pages, uh, but it shouldn't be any more than that. Most cover letters are one page. Great. Next question, should you include job history if you have no professional experience that is relevant for the position? Okay, that, and again, that depends. Um, you know, if you look at a career changer, somebody that, that's been in a, a role for 20 years, they don't wanna do it anymore, um, and you can't leave off 20 years of experience, all right? What you can do is keep your career history the same and then position yourself up in the top third of the resume for your career change. Um, if you've, uh, there, you'll see in the inexperienced sample resumes, there, there's, I think it's uh, somebody that had a, they worked for a food service company and then they had a dog bakery business, okay, while they were in college. You still want that, on there, even if it's not relevant to what you're going for, because it shows that you have worked and, and people like to see that. For very young people, let's say you're, you just graduated high school a few years ago and, and you were in 4-H and you, you volunteered, that's still good information, but that's not what you want if you have professional experience behind you. Great. Good to know. Uh, next question. I've heard of including things like a link to a LinkedIn profile on resumes. Is this a good idea? Yes. Uh, also a portfolio or, you know, a website. And portfolio, I'm going to make the assumption that that means that it would be a creative portfolio, say graphic design or something like that. Um, that's okay to have to absolutely have your LinkedIn URL on your resume. Make sure that you've cleaned up your LinkedIn URL so that all the, the extraneous numbers and letters at the end of your name um, are cleaned up. Um, and there's a way to do that on LinkedIn. You just go in the upper right hand corner and it says uh, customize your URL and you can, you can get all that stuff off of there. Um, but 
people love, they will go to your LinkedIn profile when you apply for a job, if they're interested in you. So make sure you have a good LinkedIn profile, make sure it's complete, make sure your URL is cleaned up, and, and even if you don't have your LinkedIn URL on your resume, they're gonna go to LinkedIn. So you might as well give them your, your, your URL, as well as your portfolio, if you have one. Great, and just to add to that, will an ATS system eliminate you for doing this? No, no. Okay. Next question, can you go over the header thing again? <laughs> I apologize. Um, what is the best way to present your initial page without a header? Okay, and I, I, I wanna make sure you understand the difference between a heading and a header. A heading is your resume heading. It's like a letterhead. Your name, your contact information, okay? Just the same as the body of your resume. A header is, it, it, I don't know what the correct way to say it is, but um, it creates that space. So it's what, inch or two wide up at the top. And it looks really pretty, um, but it won't be read. So when you go to create your document, do not create a header on page one. You can have a header with your name, your contact information on page two, but then you need to go into header and click on a second page different than first or something like that. And that will eliminate the header on the first page while keeping the header on the second page. So I hope I've addressed that. Yes, and Without, can you just repeat why, um, why you should not have that header on the first page? ATS won't read it. It can't read headers. It can't read footers, okay? It's, it's set up, um, I wish I knew the technical way, you know, term to call it, but it just, it won't read it. It'll be blank. Okay, great. Thank you for reminding us of that. Next question, how effective are letters of recommendation? And second part to that question, should these be submitted with the resume? Um, letters of recommendation, uh, it, it just depends. Um, I, I think it's a good idea if you have really outstanding ones to include if the application allows for that. Um, a lot of applications won't allow for that, so don't try to stuff them in there um, just to have them. Um, one thing you can do, and, the, and these I think carry more weight when you are just graduating. If you're new in a field and, and you have people who have worked with you in the past um, in certain areas that are relevant, um, keep in mind that employers are more interested in what you can do for them than what you might have done in a prior position unless it has to do with your character um, that you're, you're punctual, you're timely, you're ethical, um, things like that. So, but they, they can be really helpful to a, a, a recent graduate or an upcoming graduate when applying for positions. Wonderful. Next question. I always heard that keywords should not be used um, because the hiring manager would notice if an applicant tailored the resume too much. Is, it too, is this true? Um, will this deter a hiring manager? No, because I, I think it depends on how you do it. Um, if you, let's see, I'm trying to think. Um, if there was a job description and you use the exact verbiage in a sentence in your resume as in the job description in, in your resume or a cover letter, that might not sit well with them. But budgeting is budgeting. Mm. Um, and if they have budgeting in a job description and you put budgeting in your resume, they're going to go, aha, they've got what we're looking for. So no, I, um, you want to tailor your resume. 
You just don't want to be a parrot with um, sentence, sentences that you use. Great. Next question. I am retiring from the Marine Corps in two years and transitioning to a career in the healthcare field. How much of my resume should be, should be military items since it is the bulk of my adult life? Yes. And thank you for your service, by the way. Um, we do have transitioning military resume samples on our on Global Connect. Um, one of the mistakes that military tend to do is they, they use too much military jargon in their resumes and, and civilians are not going to know what that means. So when you're creating your non-military resume, try to eliminate acronyms that we won't understand unless you're going for a government contractor type position. They're going to know, but in healthcare, they're not going to know. So try to civilianize what you've done in your experience and keep it short. Um, as short so generally, you're probably just going to have a one page resume and with more civilian type verbiage. Um, you, you do want to put whether you've been honorably discharged at the end of your, your service, um, your rank at that point is going to be important. Um, later on, it doesn't matter, okay? But when you're first coming out of the military, um, and again, you'll want to use that top third of your resume to talk about what you're bringing to the table. And so a lot of former military have incredible leadership experience. So instead of saying, I was a lieutenant, um, say, I led a staff of, you know, X 100 people. Okay, that, that people go, wow, okay, rather than the lieutenant, that, that they're not going to know what that means. So I hope I covered all the bases on that one. And again, if, if you have questions, consult Global Connect, the resume samples. I'm also here, you can contact me directly if you have questions about that. Great, we have just two more questions. Uh, so first, how should you convey uh, transferable skills on your resume? Okay, we touched on that um, a little bit, but I'll go back over it. Transferable skills. Say, say, okay, say it again. <laughs> Make sure. <laughs> How should you convey transferable skills on the resume? Okay, again, that would be in your opening paragraph and or the core competencies section, which are the hard skills. So it depends on what they are. If they're soft skills that are transferring, that would be in your paragraph. If they're hard skills that are transferring, um, that would be in your um, core competencies. And I also want to mention, you know, don't disregard things that you've learned in school. Um, if you've learned about budgeting, but you've never managed a budget, you can say that you're knowledgeable about budgeting. Okay. And that can carry a lot of weight in a, in a job where you need to have budgeting in your background. Great. And final question. If there is there a free service or web page that you know of where you can test your resume in the ATS software? There are, but I don't recommend them. And, and the reason is because the ones that I'm aware of, they are all attached to resume services. What happens is you, you put your resume in there and it will parse it and it'll spit out information to you saying, you, 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 you passed with 55% and you go, oh my gosh, I only got 55%. I better, you know, revamp my resume. Oh, they're going to charge me $200 to do this. Okay. And then it'll be wonderful. Well, no, CSU Global Students and Alums, you don't need to do that. You've got us to do that for you for free. You don't need a resume service. And so I've, I've had clients in the past that, you know, would keep submitting their resumes to these services and freak out because it wasn't hitting 100%. And they spent more time worried about that than their job search. And so what we have are resume, sample resumes that are designed to get past ATS 
we have the resume review process for you. And, you know, if, if you've got a good solid resume, you're going to do fine um, in your job search as long as you follow certain, certain things. So I, I don't recommend those. Um, they are there, but I don't recommend them. Thank you so much for those resources. And uh, just a reminder to check out Global Connect. If you haven't already, uh, you know, definitely check out that website. It's a great resource. If there are any other questions at this time, please feel free to send those questions to career.center at csuglobal.edu. So a big thank you to Sue for your time and your insights. This was wonderful. This does conclude this career success webinar. Thank you to all of our viewers for joining us. We hope you found the conversation useful for your career goals. On behalf of everyone at CSU Global, thank you and have a great rest of the day.